Yo, Lunar Space, Worm Harvester, Andy, whatever you want to call me in the cut. It's Rojo, and we in Queens with Colin Marston. <sighs> Colin freaking Marston. So Colin Marston, tell us about who you are and what exactly is it that you do? Well, it all starts back in 1982 when I was born. Um, I am, in all seriousness, a musician and recording engineer, and we're in my studio, Menegroth, right now. Um, I um, engineer, mix, and master uh, all sorts of different kinds of music, um, potentially with a specialty for uh, things that are less traditional. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, in some way, um, potentially experimental. And uh, I suppose you could say the same thing about the music I make. Absolutely. <laughs> so I guess one of the first questions I wanted to jump right into was, why the name Menegroth? Menegroth is from, uh, it was just a, a title lifted from a uh, Tolkien book. Mm -hmm. not, the, not the Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit, but the Silmarillion, which was the one that he wrote that was a um, almost read more like a, a history or like an epic poem, mm -hmm. uh, more in the style of like a Beowulf or Gilgamesh or the Bible wow. um, than like a adventure story. Right. Uh, so right. it's it's a it's a series of short stories and and histories about the um, the origins of this uh, mythic world that he created. Right. Right. And Menegroth was a um, one of the ancient cities of the elves. Oh, wow. Uh, and the Thousand Caves. Menegroth, the Thousand Caves is the full title, and uh, the Thousand Caves was named just because of how sort of confusing this studio is in terms of the layout and the number of hallways and doors and rooms. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So you're in, uh, you're in multiple bands that are based out of New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of those bands? Uh, so the bands that I've had for the longest are Behold the Octopus, started in 2001 in New York. Dysrhythmia, which started in Philadelphia, and um, when I met those guys, they were they were there, and that's where I grew up. And then I joined in 2004 uh, after already being in New York, and so the rest of the guys relocated here in uh, the next couple of years after that. Um, then in 2008, uh, or 2007, I guess we sort of started Kralis, although it started more as a recording project and then sort of over the next year evolved into a band that had a bass player and played shows and stuff and uh the same year 2008 um kevin from Disrhythmia and i joined core guts and have been doing that ever since so the two of us are here and then luke and um patrice uh are in quebec um i think one pressing question that i think will be necessary to ask right now is really who is going to win this game of Uno that we are about to play right now but uh yeah going back to those projects how did you you know really get involved with Gorguts who is based in what part of Canada? Is it? In, in Quebec, Quebec. Um, yeah. there we go. Uh, Luke um, lives they, they both live sort of near Montreal but mm -hmm. neither of them in the city um, Patrice is in Trois-Rivières which is uh an hour, an hour and a half um, towards Quebec City, and then Luke is uh, sort of east of Montreal and a little bit south, uh, actually like closer to the U.S. a little bit, oh, okay. uh, but out in, in the, in the uh, sort of rural farm area. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, Beautiful. Yeah, definitely. I, like, I haven't been, but, you know, Canada definitely seems like a very interesting place. I mean, it's, it's, it's the most gorgeous place you could ever go, not in the not in the winter. What's it like in the winter? Fuck that place. In the <laughs> I love Canada, but oh my god. You heard it here. Far first. too cold. Yeah, far too cold. New York's far too cold. Yeah, oh, sure. It's, 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 already, it's already too bad here. Yeah, yeah. And the farther north you go. Oh, oh my god. Yeah. yeah, there's like something that happens when you cross the border over there. Just suddenly it's just like... What the fuck? Yeah, just just snow in the air constantly. Right oh. No, I'm exaggerating, but... Uh, well, we all know gets both. we all know that the government controls the weather. Of course, yeah, that's I mean, why in, that's... in combination with the aliens. Yeah, straight <laughs> off, you know. Um, but yeah, you said New York is far too cold. Uh, <laughs> I recall that you're you're not from New York, so tell us about the origin story. Well, uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not from New York, but I'm from Philadelphia, so mm -hmm. it's more or less the same climate. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, but yeah, I, I grew up there and moved to New York when I was 17 um, to go to recording school and then stay here and started started my own studio. So you graduated high school at the age of 17 and went? No, no. Uh, well, yeah, 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 yes, totally. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I did, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. And then you went straight to NYU. Right. So tell us about that experience at NYU. Um, it was it was really cool. I mean, it was it was a mix, as a, as I'm sure anybody who's been through uh, higher education or really any kind of education, it's, it's usually some kind of a mix mm-hmm. of positive and negative experience. Um, I think I had a pretty positive experience overall, but. Um, you know, NYU is a huge corporation, and its interests are not a hundred percent educating people. That's <laughs> that's part of what they do. Um, so there was uh, there was aspects of the of the program that were really useful, and that you know things that I learned that I still use to this day. And there were some aspects of it that were a waste of time. But um, overall, uh, I feel happy that I. Uh, invested myself in something that really just immediately and directly impacted um, how I'm earning my living and what I'm sort of doing with my life in courts. Right, right, right. Uh, so you know, I know that that's that's a, that's a big issue with with the educational system in this country in general, and you know, just anywhere in the world. Of uh, there's people that don't have access to it that really could use it, and then there's a lot of people that have access to it but don't really make use of it in a way that makes any sense or is practical. Right. So I feel like um, it was a, a combination of, of hard work, but also like a lot of luck on my part that I just kind of like found what I love to do very early in my life and then, um, you know, found like a way to work higher education into it and then, and then also like a, a, a job slash career, whatever you want to call it. Right. Right. Hardly, hardly either of those things. <laughs> so you, you went to school for, was it music technology? Yeah, that was exactly what the, the major was called. Um, but it was, so yeah, music technology being a slightly more general term than what I specialized in, which is pretty much like recording right, right. bands, for lack of a better term, bands and musicians. Um, what well, uh, acoustic recording, like for, it could be like a way to, to to call it. Although not everything I record is acoustic, but you know I'm not working in purely electronic music. I'm not doing. Um, I, do, I have done a little bit of audio for for video, like audio for films and stuff like that. But that's definitely like not the majority of what I do. Mostly what I do is I make records for lack for lack of a better term, rock bands or um, the the more sort of uh, improvised experimental music. Right, right. So was it your involvement uh, in the scene that really drove you to all of uh, the recording for different bands? Sure, yeah. I mean, uh, I started playing music and recording um, right, at the, right at the same time. So I, I, uh, when I first started playing guitar, I think within a year or two, I was borrowing a four track and <laughs> messing around with making my own recordings. And then eventually... Uh, was able to borrow a computer recording setup and get into that a few years later. And um, so, yeah, my, my, I think my musical creative process has always sort of gone hand in hand with recording and making my own recordings. Like I, th- there's only been two times in my entire life that I've recorded with somebody else. Oh. Every single other recording that I've done for myself and for other people, obviously I've done. Um, so that's just how I came into music. Um, was was yeah through both angles simultaneously. Or um, what did early Colin Marston sound like when you borrowed that four track <laughs> initially? Uh, I should I can't remember where it is. I should dig it out for you. I have my my solo album that I made in high school. Holy shit! Four track somewhere. What genre is it? It was prog rock. Prog rock for oh, sure. What like King Crimson influence? Very King Crimson influenced. I mean, as as for how much it actually sounds like that, <clears throat> hard for me to say. You know, right? Lack of, with a lack of perspective, but um, yeah, it was all pretty much instrumental. I played uh, I played all the instruments on it, but then I also had guest musicians. So I I think I did guitar, bass, war guitar, drums, Jeez. and then I had a you know, I had a friend uh, play keyboards who was I was in the band a band with at the time, and then my my buddy who I was in my first two bands with, uh, or first three bands with George Corrine, um, 
I'm sure he was a guest on it too. And uh, yeah, in, in any case, so yeah. Um, Frog from the beginning. Frog from the beginning. I was I was really obsessed with King Crimson growing up. Um, when I first heard that band, it was like a definitely like a whole consuming world, and, and they already had. But when I came to them, it was nineteen ninety three or four. Um, so they were in. They were already in the like you know seventh incarnation of the band, right? Uh, and had 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 so many different st- styles and periods and. Uh, lineup changes and uh, sounds and so on. So it really like was a whole universe to dive into. I feel like since I didn't really get into extreme metal until a little bit later, um, with the exception of a couple a couple bands, I think when a, when a lot of people get into that world or into electronic music or something, there's there's such a, a richness to the genre and there's so many people and bands and artists contributing to that style. And with King Crimson, I feel like it was sort of like the opposite, where I found one band that had created this whole sort of mini scene right. just themselves. Mm-hmm. And because I was coming to it all these years later, um, I could really sort of pick apart their whole career and, and all the all the live records and just really got to know every every bit of the, of the band's uh, recorded mm-hmm. you know catalog instead of kind of getting into like the thrash scene or something and then checking out all the thrash bands, which is like, okay, well, this band kind of has has uh, everything that I need. It's got composition, it's got improvisation, it's got ballads, it's got really naughty, dissonant music. And that was always the stuff I was the most attracted to. But it gave me an appreciation for stuff like ballads that I never really gave a shit about. Mm-hmm. And and I'm not going to say still don't, but <laughs> it, it's just not my tendency is to make music like that. Um, but, you know, getting that as part of the package with this band doing this other stuff that was really attractive to me, I think helped me retain more of an open mind and not get so stuck in like one really specific sound. It was like they had such a big variety to their sound. Great variety that um, I think that that helped me like appreciate lots of different kinds of music. And now that I work with all these different um, kinds of people in the studio, I think that was like a good primer to, um, you know, having an appreciation for stuff that's really sparse and really loose and stuff that's really tight and really dense and everything in between. Right, right. It's funny because... um, one of my music teachers, he's a huge King Crimson head. He actually just saw them live, and he's like, if they're still like amazing live, and he's a huge jazz fusion kind of guy. And it's crazy to see like how that one band kind of influenced like so many people all around. You, you know, they've they've done so many interesting things. So on the topic of influences, I remember reading an interview where you said that Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring was one of those things that like you know really expose you to that you know different side of music that you weren't exposed to so talk to us about classical music and what Stravinsky means to you yeah for sure um that that was something that I remembered because it was like it was played for my music class at school Mm -hmm. you know I remember sort of like I don't know how old I was but I was pretty pretty damn young Mm -hmm. and you know sort of like sitting in a circle on the floor and the music teacher putting that on and me being like oh okay this is like this is really grabbing me. Like, this is intense. Right. Um, and I, I don't think right away I was like, okay, I got to check out all this dissonant 20th century classical music, but it definitely made a big impression. And then I remember in high school um, finding, like, the Bartok string quartets and, like, borrowing them from the library at, at school. Mm-hmm. And... Um, you know, that being like another, uh, uh, you know, famous piece of classical music, but like another uh, thing that really kind of like kicked my ass right away. Right, right. Um, and then uh, after that, I think it was probably Penderecki, mm-hmm. which uh, I heard the the threnody to the victims of Hiroshima probably, you know, I don't know, when I was 16 or 17, like a lot of the stuff that really impacted me was like in the same four or five year right, right. span. Um, and yeah, that was, that was just, that was the most in, intense emotional music I think I ever heard at that point. And, 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 and in a way, still to this day, um, such an amazing piece of music. And, and, a, and a, a lot of the music that he was writing in that period mm-hmm. really, really inspired me. Um, just in terms of being like this combination of, extremely visceral and immediately emotional, but 
also really detailed and technical and, and uh, um, dissonant and asymmetrical and all those things at the same time. And I think a lot of times, both classical and metal and rock music and stuff, that tends to be more technical and angular and dissonant in all those terms, a lot of people uh, give it the um, unfair categorization sometimes of, as being very like, unemotional. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of that music is, some of it is, but I think a lot of the stuff that comes off to people that way isn't that way to me. And yeah, so so in other words, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff we could agree on is maybe like not really hitting the the emotional uh, the emotions the same way. That's that's kind of like um, overly complicated and so on. But uh, the, the music that's hit me the hardest often is has both of those things sort of in equal proportions. Um, and, uh, to me, that's kind of some of the heaviest music out there is, is when you, you, you hear it and you're immediately hit by it, but it doesn't necessarily all make sense right away. It's not giving you all the answers. Absolutely. You know, just like when you read a good book or watch a good TV or show or something, it's not going to explain everything right away. It's going to make you do a little bit of work mm -hmm. to put yourself in the, uh, atmosphere of it and think about it and maybe try to reach some of your own conclusions. And then the next time you see it, or maybe by the end of the piece or by the end of the episode or the end of the book, you're like, ah, I so now that mystery really meant something. Right. and really like mattered to me once the thing was, was complete. So that was a, uh, that was a thing that, um, Bartok and Penderecki and, 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 uh, um, Stravinsky. And then, and then also later like Alfred Schnittke and Luciano Berrio and, Perez and mm -hmm. um, Carter and uh, some of these other guys that I found a little bit later, um, I, I, I feel like they really represented that. And they get and some of these guys get a bad rep for just being like you know this it overly intellectual stuff. But it's like it, you know that that that's just to me that's kind of just happenstance right. that it was that it was made in this academic way. It's like there's plenty of music that that like popular Mozart or something that people might view as being the most beautiful music ever made. And to me, it's just corny. Right. Yeah. It's just, I don't know. It's just, it's not, there's no tension. It's, mm -hmm. it's all just like straightforward, like classical. Yeah. Pop music. Yeah. Just sort of like, uh, easily digestible exactly. and, uh, yeah, no, 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 no real struggle, no real tension and release. Just, just, just nice. Right. You know? Straight and I don't, I don't really need just nice. <laughs> As a as a fan of classical and dissonance, um, in 2013 you were working with Gorguts to release Colored Sands. How was that process? Oh, uh, awesome, but really uh, drawn out. Um, we recorded the record two years before that, in uh, February uh, 2011. Okay. And then because of the... Uh, Luke was in negotiations to change the record contract and ended up switching labels in the process. That whole thing took two years. So it was um, a long time of, he would come in and track the vocals here. Uh, we, we recorded in Quebec the basic tracks, but then we did all the vocals and sort of overdubs and stuff here. So gradually every few months he'd come in and he'd do a song and stuff. So there was like a little bit of progress the whole time and we played shows and stuff, but there was definitely this feeling that all of us had. It was just kind of like, ah, when are we going to get to finish this thing and release it and let people hear it? So that, that aspect of it was frustrating, but the way, the way that it finally came out and we're all very happy with, and, um, I think, uh, it was, it was, it was a great record to make. Oh, like, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't like a struggle to make the record. It was really fun. Uh, but it just got, got very drawn out. Did you feel pressured at all? I mean, the, Previous album wasn't released. I mean, it was released in two thousand one. Yeah. Um. So twelve years in the making. What did you feel any pressure towards that? Yeah, I think yes and no because uh, I, I didn't feel any pressure in the way that like I drove myself crazy or anything like that. But I, I definitely felt it. And being a fan of the band before joining, um, I think I felt some sort of a responsibility that whatever I wrote in terms of bass lines and, and also the one song on the album that I wrote everything for, um, I did feel a responsibility for it to like have a continuity with the records that came before. Um, and I think I also, yeah, I maybe limited myself in terms of the kinds of things I was writing on bass 
due to the way I perceived the style of the previous bass players in the band. So sure, I think, I, yeah, I did I did feel pressure for it to be Gorguts in the way that I had that in I mean, my, reason, in my reasonably head. Reasonably so, yeah, reasonably so. Yeah, and then I think for Pleiades, for the next album, I, I didn't feel that at all. And, and when we made that record, I just was like, okay, now I'm in this band. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm not going to think about any of that stuff anymore. I'm just going to write what I think would sound cool right now. And plus you mixed and mastered it as well, right? Both of the records. Oh, okay. Yeah. Awesome. So same with that. Was there any form of pressure in trying to match a sound that they've had for you know decades? I think so. In that respect, it was less of a pressure to match or follow the sound and more of a pressure to do the opposite, which is to fix all the stuff I didn't like uh, about okay. <laughs> the way the, uh, the previous records had sounded. So um, that said, now with many years removed from both of both of the records that I've mixed for Gorguts and also from the from the other records I now appreciate the sound of the older records a lot more but yes there's there's aspects of every single one of them that I like and that I don't like and for sure at the at the time of Colored Sands I was probably feeling even more uh, pressure or whatever to have it not have any of the of the aspects of the other records that I didn't like, right, right. Um, and and also, I you know I, I'm I'm often in comparison I think to other people that work on extreme metal, looking for something that's, for lack of a better term, like a more organic or just normal sound. Like I'm not into like hyper produced metal where like all the drums are sound replaced and um, everything sounds like every note was punched where in. Where everything automates. Section. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I like recordings of bands that sound like bands, and I like when the drums sound like there's somebody just playing drums in a room. Like and, just a rock band approach. Yeah, and and that I, I'm not gonna. I'm not saying that I want a Gorguts record to be produced like a Dark Throne record. Like I'm not saying like, just put one overhead mic up and and then you know as Fender says we don't mix we just make sure everything is there. I'm not gonna do that. Um, but I also don't want to approach the mix in the way that I think a lot of these modern metal guys approach the mix where everything is kind of like taken apart and reconstructed synthetically. Um, so yeah, so I, I wanted to make sure that Colored Sands also had like some space to it and, and, and weight and, you know, all the things that like the best rock recordings have that right. I've always appreciated about like a Led Zeppelin recording or, um, an Iron Maiden record or something where like, you know, it sounds like musicians and playing their instruments. Straight up. Yeah. And the thing is, it's like all, all the musicians in Gorguts are killer. So it's like, why would I want to do anything to take away from the feel? I want, I want to like help display their feel and their musicianship in the, in the best That's way. I can. That's kind of the way I'm looking at it. So does that mean pulling away every little, uh, um, you know, Aaron guitar noise or, um, you know, like boosting every drum hit that's not as loud as the other drum hit. No, I'm just going to do the ones where I think I, maybe it yes. helps and just not go too crazy with it and, and and hopefully have it still sound the way we sound. Straight up. Not, not rob it of the, the humanity. Absolutely. Um, it's funny because I remember uh, years ago when I met Eric, his Instagram username was Colored Sands with a Z. Nice. <laughs> uh, and my current username is Worm Harvester, which is a artificial, artificial brain, brain song. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. An artificial brain song. So, talk to me about working with Artificial Brain. They are awesome. Uh, I've done two two records for them, and uh, then with Will, I've also did the new Afterbirth record. How oh, true. And. Uh, also, he came in and did some guest spots on Imperial Triumphant and stuff. So I've gotten to work with um, with Will a lot and, and Artificial Brain for both records. And yeah, uh, love working with those guys. They're not only just super fun dudes to hang out with and have a good sense of humor, but obviously killer musicians. They really have their shit together. I remember like um, it, it was almost adorable. Like when, <laughs> when uh, Dan first got in touch with me about the first album, he was kind of like asking me a lot of these questions like you know do, should we do we have to do the kind of thing where we like if i wrote the riffs like i should play all the guitars like the way mashuga does their records like uh, okay 
if one guitar player didn't write uh, riffs on a certain song, like she just won't play on that song. Mm-hmm. He's just not there. Right. Oh. And it's just Frederick maybe playing the Frederick riffs and just Martin playing the Martin riffs. So he was asking me, you know, like, do, kind of like, should we do that? Do we have to do that? And I, and I just remember kind of chuckling and being like, well, you don't have to do anything. You can just, this is your album. You can do it the way you want. Like, you know, he's like, well, do we have to each double our guitar process? I was like, well, you can't, you can if you want, but you know, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a, it, the, the idea that there are certain ways you have to make a record anywhere from the way it's tracked to the way it's mixed is a, is a, is a common, um, conception. I'm not, I'm not even going to say misconception because it, it's not a conception or a misconception. It's just an option, right? Like any way you want to make your record is, is fine. And we have these conventions that are there, but like, yeah, you know, just take the conventions you like and don't take the ones you don't. Right. And I, I also, to, to be fair to Dan, you know, a lot of what he was asking isn't just like, is this the way we have to do it? He was just, you know, he was asking me since we hadn't worked together yet, how do you like to work and what are your suggestions? And so, you know, um, I understand that, that side of it as well. Uh, but yeah, my, my suggestion is usually just to default to the band. Like, how do you, how do you like to do it? What kind, what kind of sound do you want? You know, cause something like, um, the two guitar players each doubling their own tracks. That's something Gorguts does and Kralis does pretty much every recording. But I often don't do that with a lot of other bands. And like in Behold the Arctopus, we we do a lot of stuff not double tracked. It's almost it's mostly single track stuff. And I think it just depends on the nature of the music, mm-hmm. um, the nature of the riffs, and and uh, and also even just what it sounds like on that given recording. Right. So um, you know you can sometimes get a tighter, more precise sound not doubling stuff. Right. Um... So, camera's about to run. Yeah. I bet. Um, so, you know, going back to, like, artificial brain and stuff like that, um, I remember when I first discovered them, I found out that they were from our hometown, and it was just yeah. like, what the hell? Like, I hate my hometown. <laughs> <laughs> so, these guys actually make it really fucking cool to, like, be from here. So, it's pretty cool to see that you got to work with, like, you know, like, local hometown heroes and stuff That's like awesome, that. That's awesome, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, um it's interesting how Dan, you know, asks you those kinds of questions because it's like, you know, you're talking freaking Colin Marston, you know, um, when I started interning here, for those who don't know, I worked here as an intern for a few months during my junior year of college. And, um, you know, I remember just like being in awe. I was just like a kid in a candy shop, like, holy shit, what's going on here? And I got to like meet, uh, some of the, the bands that, you know, you don't get a lot of credit for like you know uh, i remember we worked you worked with a band called pack you know you told me you worked with a classical artist named judith berkson yeah yeah um, yeah she's amazing yeah uh you worked with this band called winter triangles <laughs> yeah. uh yeah the next so, big thing the next <laughs> big thing uh so yeah talk to me about working with those uh, you know lesser known artists um i often the lesser known stuff is the is kind of my favorite and, and the best stuff i mean uh you know, artificial brain is awesome, and I'm glad that they're so well known. But yeah, I mean, there's there's stuff like Judith's music, which is I don't think is is probably ever going to have a big audience. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, you know, she's just not out playing tons of shows, and she's not in a scene that's kind of like the metal scene that's as supportive. You know, right. just it, the the world of uh, you know avant garde classical music and and extreme improvisation is just never going to have a big audience. But I'm so happy that I get to work with a lot of the, those really out there artists because I just appreciate um, music that's really trying to do something different and, and, and pushing pushing your brain into some uncomfortable new territory. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So you said you said Luke comes from, he was coming from Canada to record vocals. Um, yeah. What are some other artists and how far have they come to I record here? I just had a band here from Rome. Ooh, wow. Um, I've had some bands from Australia. Um, yeah, all over. Uh, like, especially in the in the, the kinds of work that I do where I don't actually have bands coming in, but I'm just doing like a mix um, or mastering something. Uh, I'll get stuff from all over the world. Yeah, India. Um, You've had people from India come here? Yeah, a couple, well, no, not not coming in, but yeah, like did, I've done Yo, two or three remote, remote, remote <laughs> sessions. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, I'm clutching on the the name of the band right now, but um, but yeah, uh, 
uh, uh, Diofago from Costa Rica. Actually, two bands from Costa Rica actually come and come and record them in Corpse Garden for wow, another one of my fa- my favorite <laughs> sessions. Holy shit! That's really awesome. cool experimental metal bands. Oh, um, I remember Japan was here one time when when we were. Japan, I've recorded a bunch of times. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're all they're all uh, living in the states these days, but yeah. you know, obviously, like all those dudes are from Nepal originally. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, all all all. Uh, one, some of my favorite musicians I work with these days are from uh, Barcelona. Barcelona. Um, they haven't actually come into the studio, but they've sent me a bunch of records to mix and master. It's like a flute player, an upright bass player, and a percussionist, and they do various combinations of those three musicians. I actually have one to master uh, next week. Oh shit! Um, but yeah, in humankind. Is the duo of the bass player and the flute player, Word. and um, and Vasco Trila is the percussionist who did, did a solo record for, and um, they they just did a trio record. That's the new one I'm working on, which I'm not sure if it has a band name yet. Wow, um, you know, as you worked with Gorgas from Canada, I'm aware that you did like I believe a little bit of mastering work for a band called Mitochondrion. Yeah, a I, band from Canada, so yeah. Talk yeah, about from it. Vancouver. Yeah. Um, before they, you, hold up. Before yeah, yeah. we go into that, let's get this game of Uno going. Oh, yeah. yeah. You could uh, you could start off. Um, let me just toss that down. So yeah, yeah. So you did a little bit of work with Mitochondrion. So tell us about Mitochondrion. Um, Mitochondrion is an awesome death metal band from Vancouver. Mm-hmm. Um, they I I mastered I think three things for them. So both of their full lengths and. Uh, the anti numerology seven inch. That's a great fucking record, honestly. I remember um I remember hearing that record, I was like, what the fuck am I listening to? You know? <laughs> and plus it had your your style of um production on it, you know. It kind of blew my mind. Um but yeah, furthermore. But yeah, they do they do all their own recording and mixing. I think Nick, uh, the one guitar player, does all the production and they really take their time and they spend a long time like crafting this horrifying psychedelic soup. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that, uh, I have, because of that, I haven't, I haven't gotten to like get into the nitty gritty of them because I haven't tracked or mixed any of their stuff, just done mastering. But for Parasignosis, their second album, which is I think the first thing I mastered for them, mm-hmm. I remember it being a pretty intense mastering job because uh, they were just, they're just very exacting of what they want. And then there was also a numerological aspect to the timing and the track layout of mm-hmm. the album. And I can't remember all the details, but there was some idea about having like multiple tracks in a row with no length. And I, I learned that you can't you can't actually do that oh. <laughs> in a uh, CD burning program. You can the minimum length I could get was four seconds, so we ended oh. up having like three four second tracks in a row. Or oh. I don't know, it was something <laughs> um, that was I, I just really appreciated how into it they were getting in terms of this stuff that for most people is just like not even a concern just right. like whatever right uh, yeah you have as many tracks on the album as you have tracks but no they had they had there was more there was more in there they really knew yeah. what they wanted to do no it was, it was it was cool and i you know i don't know i just appreciate weirdos and people doing stuff that's just what, why why would they do that like if i have to answer, ask myself that question then it's probably pretty interesting I'm <laughs> probably gonna like it. Speaking of weirdos, <laughs> speaking of weirdos, you were on this album. It's from a band called Glyptoglossio, and the album is called. How do you even pronounce that word right there? Oh, that's Yota Anums in the Bis. Yota Anums in the Bis. So talk to us about this record. Talk to us about this band. So that is the second album by Glyptoglossio, which is myself, uh, Elian Gazard and Nandor Navai on drums. Elian played guitar on the first album and then bass on the on this one, um, which is an instrument that she's spent a lot more time with. So um, we all we all think that this one came out really good. Um, but yeah, so Nandor is a composer, drummer, vocalist, um, artistic powerhouse. Wow. And he um conceptualizes the albums well in advance he will give us uh all the lyrics and there's always like he'll tape together about eight pages of lyrics <laughs> and uh then he'll have maybe like you know five to eight different ideas for improvisations that we can do 
and we get together and we do, and they're all very specific. Like I play these kinds of notes. I never play at the same time as the bass. Um, and we do that. And then there's one where like, I'm, 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 I'm not explaining it well. They'll have, um, yeah, different configurations of improvisations he wants to try. So, um, he'll specify different kinds of material that we're supposed to play, but without, without it being like actual riffs or notes, it'll, sure, just, yeah. it'll be like more vague than that. So we'll create a bank of all these different ideas. Uh -huh. And then what I do is I go in and cut together, um, all these little snippets into like large pieces. And I usually our albums are like two long songs. Wow. So this one, this one's like that. And then, um, but the, 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 uh, the other thing that makes it a little bit less typical is that he'll actually record the vocals and the lyrics, not first. We'll do the improvisations first, but I, I use that to base the structuring of the music. Most of the time when we're making music as like more or less rock musicians, the rhythm section is constructed first and then we put the things like the lead vocals on top. But this is done the other way around where I'll have him just reading all the lyrics and then I'll use that to like put the music on top of and decide what goes where. You build it from the back. Yeah, so the vocal and the lyrics are really like the, that's the skeleton of the music. And the drums, the bass, and the guitar are kind of like the lead vocal. <laughs> was that done here? Yeah, yeah, we did both records here. Um, the last one was just band camp only. This one actually came out on CD. Sweet. Uh, so go pick it up. Yeah, absolutely. This up right here. Yeah, and where was this picture taken? This was taken right right. That's down in Forest Park, yeah. Forest <laughs> Park. <laughs> down on the uh, there's like the uh, the Strack Memorial Pond. <laughs> oh, That's oh peak God. New York right there. Holy shit! Yeah. Wow. So the three of us were actually ori like originally from Queens. Oh, nice. So why did you choose Queens? Oh, uh, like to to, to so have a studio here? Yeah, yeah, have a studio. Oh, this oh, was sorry. the studio that I found. Oh yeah. Is it just straight up? Where where were you looking before? Um, I mean, I you don't look in any particular kind of place for a place like this. You right. just look and you find it, and then you thank your lucky stars you found it, and you stay there. Jeez, wow, yeah. I mean, so yeah, no no big idea. Just this is this is the space that the I found. Best space you can find, yeah. and you just built all of your booth studio. No, this was already here. Wow. 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 wow! Yeah, that's a, that's, that's crazy. That's why I'm here. So, like, who was here before? This has been a lot of different studios over the years. Oh shit! Wow, you've been here for since like what 2006? Yeah, yes, yeah, 2006. Mm -hmm. um, how has this place like changed over the years? Has it changed? Um, in little ways, but it's more or less the same. Right. It's been yeah. I mean, no, no huge significant changes. Uh, you know, different gear in here. I. Spent a long time as a mostly analog studio with two inch tape machines. Oh, um, and then uh, in, I don't know, what was it like? Maybe 2013 or something, I switched to just being fully digital. I used to do like tracking to tape and then mixing in the computer, but now I just do everything in the computer. Oh, okay. Um, got rid of the console, got digital headphone mixers. Yeah, just basically like stripped down the inessential aspects and tried to focus more on. Uh, getting better monitoring here. Right. So now in like the live room, for instance, everybody has their own headphone mixer, whereas before there was always like a day of trying to get the mixes right with uh -huh. people yelling at me and me trying to get the console and then it would never quite still sound quite that good. Um, so yeah, that was switching to the fully digital setup with the, the individual headphone mixers was like probably the, probably the biggest improvement that I've made in the studio in the past uh, you know decade. Right, right. Um, also, it's your turn, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this studio is honestly one of the craziest things to like be inside of, you know. Let's focus on the important thing. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you I don't out? even know which way we're going. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's All right. Oh, God. I got skip. I got skip. Uh, uh, pass. What do I do? Oh, you got to pick up one card. That's right. Yeah. There we go. Oh, we forget how to play this. Oh, perfect. Oh, God damn it. Ah, all right. So yeah, so we were just talking about queens and stuff like that. Yeah, me, Eric, and Jordan, we've all lived at all past by the way. Um, we've all lived here for for years and stuff like that, and we've seen a lot of weird things in New York. You know, especially on the trains in the city, living in Queens. So tell us about your weird experiences in New York. My weirdest experiences draw four. Oh, well, you know what, Colin? Fuck you. And fuck you, Eric. <laughs> Wait, but don't I have to call the color? 
Oh, yeah, but we do, like, stack, like, plus twos and plus fours regardless. That's right, okay, yeah. so you could do that even if I change the color, okay, yeah. got it. Apparently, according to the UNO rules, they say you can't stack plus twos and plus fours, but you're hearing it first, fuck the official <laughs> this, UNO this rules. This is the queen's way of This is the queen's <laughs> way. Let's go. <laughs> so, Eric, you gotta pick up six. Jeez. <laughs> oh, man, that's brutal. Holy shit. It's kind of like living in New York. Yeah, yeah straight, straight up. up. Straight up. This is what it's like to have de Blasio as mayor. You just get plus <laughs> six. <Yeah. laughs> like you can't get that in other states. <laughs> you stacking colors? Yeah, you stacking colors. Oh, my Jesus. That was a flat play. Wait, how did you do that? <laughs> oh, because oh, you're 999. Nine, nine. There you go. If you're 555. Five, five, then I'm 999. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> That's been a joke in Crowlis for a long time. Really? Wow. <laughs> um, all right, nine. All right, nine. Oh, sorry, Colin. Oh. Sorry, Eric. You know? Oh. It's real tense out here. This one will get. Yeah, so weirdest experience in Queens or New York in general. What's my weirdest experience in Queens? Well, not even weirdest experience in general, just weird experiences in general. Like, I mean, like, what's going on around here? Mm. Weird shit that you've seen in New York. Mm. This is where we have to take a pause in the game because you know you see a lot of weird shit in New York. <laughs> I mean, I I feel like I there's not that much weird stuff. Like, what was that? I can't explain it necessarily. But this is the most like probably pyromaniac neighborhood I've ever. <laughs> Been in like every Fourth of July, uh -huh. this neighborhood goes crazy with fucking fireworks. Really, um, it sounds like you're in a war zone. Oh shit! Uh, and then there's the time that I found a uh, like a whole burnt out jeep like in the park, like kind of up by the golf course. What the fuck? Like uh, off the road. There's this part where the sort of the road's going through, and then there's a footpath and there was a truck that had been like rolled onto the footpath that was just had had clearly like completely exploded wow such a charred mass wow so did you was that like Woodhaven's got to chill with the, yeah, well, with the, the fire. fire yeah <laughs> holy shit wow. um yeah I don't know so obviously you're on the road a lot too do you have any crazy stories just probably have on? crazier stories from the road if I can think of any well I mean you've been like all around the world at this Pretty much at this point. I'm yeah, I mean, you know, it's like tra traveling, as I'm sure anybody that's done any of it knows, is, is a whole lot of just waiting and being bored. Mm. Um, and then occasionally having something go going wrong and being really stressed out about not being able to get where you're going and wait and be bored. But, um, yeah, I mean, okay, okay. So this is probably the craziest thing that ever happened to me in terms of a travel story. Um, and it was, a, it was a quite a long time ago. It was my first tour of Europe. The whole The Octopus was going to go over in fall of 2008. So you just... Oh, yeah. So the story, so the story of the Europe tour. Right. So I'm visiting my uh, girlfriend at the time in the hospital, getting foot surgery, post-foot surgery, making sure she's okay, about to go on this first European tour with the whole The Octopus. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's time so that I would, I would theoretically fly back from Cleveland, get into New York, um, sometime in the afternoon, go to Mike Lerner's place, pick up my um, war guitar case, and then the next morning we would fly to, or that, yeah, no, the next, the next day we'd fly to Europe. So there was some weather-related problems or something, but my flight from Cleveland to New York got grounded in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania wow. at, like, in the evening, like 8 or 9 p.m. or something like that. And we sat on the runway, and they're like, all right, we're going to take off again. You know, it's going to be cool. We sat there for a couple hours. And then eventually they were like, we're really sorry. We've been uh, working too long. We're not allowed to take off again now <laughs> because of, you know, flight regulations. Like, you know, you, <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> pilot and so on can't work longer than X number of hours in the day. Wow. And they couldn't, they didn't have anybody else there to fly the plane. So they're like, we... We're dropping, we're dropping you off here in Harrisburg. Wow. So I was like, okay. So I was like, all right, I got to get get another flight to New York or something. So we get in there. There's no other flights 
uh, that are going to get in in time that I can get on. Um, so I'm like, all right, rental car. Uh, waiting in, in line at the rental car place, and it's whatever the time of day was where it was about to close in five minutes, oh, and was like God. the last person in the line when they closed their doors. Oh, you were that asshole. So, yeah, I was the last person that couldn't get a rental car. So I was like, wow, now what do I do? Was at was looking into trains and buses, like any kind of public transportation would go there. But it's Harrisburg, so they all, everything just shuts down at night. Like, wow. there's just no 24-hour transit out of the city. So, everybody, you know, the, the, there's, like, a bunch of people from the flight milling around, the, the, the few people that had to get to, that had to, get to New York. Mm-hmm. Um, and I overhear this one guy being like, hey, like, anybody want to go in on a cab? Okay. So I was like, yeah, I guess I guess I do. I gotta, I've got to get home. I've got to do this tour. Like, there's no way I'm missing my first European tour ever. Um, and... So we got me and two other people, the guy who was sort of spearheading this cab trip and, and another woman. And uh, I was like, all, this is all the money I have on me. It was like 60 bucks or 70 bucks or whatever. And the guy was like, okay, I've really got to get back. So whatever it ends up being, I can't remember if we knew at the time that it was going to be like two or $300. But uh, in any case, the guy was like, I'll cover whatever the difference is. Just give me, that's fine. I'll take that. And from the other woman, you know, whatever you have. And wow. I'll, I'll cover the rest. Um, and we'll, we'll take this cab to New York. So we get in the cab. We're driving. I mean, it's Harrisburg to New York. So it's a good three-hour trip, if, if, if not more. And, you know, everybody's exhausted. I start kind of dozing off in the back seat. I wake up to us, like pulling over on the side of the highway in the middle of the night because the cab driver started falling asleep at the wheel. Oh! (laughs) So the guy who had organized the cab trip, who was sitting in the passenger seat, took over and did the rest of the drive. (laughs) Which, like, there's no way that's legal. What the fuck? And, you know, at the time, I was was, like, delirious and whatever and and, and didn't think maybe I should just, like, stop and get a hotel and yeah like, fuck this or, or, or whatever i was just determined to make it back so we uh we we made it back and the 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 passenger dropped me off like right outside the lincoln tunnel in times square and i got on like the f to the j and got back here um to the studio at like 7 a.m or something Went to my buddy's house, picked up the road case, and we went straight to the airport and just barely made our wow. flight to Europe. Holy shit. That's fucking insane. So, yeah, by the time I actually got to Germany or wherever we flew in, it, it, it had been like two or three days steady, stressful, stressful. Like, traveling for me. So, yeah, I mean, that's like, that's the, that's the worst it gets is when stuff like that happens. Like, you're just going to miss your connection. And then the whole reason that you did all this preparation and spent all this time and stuff is kind of like it hanging in the balance. Right. So that's when touring really sucks. But uh, most of the time, it's just kind of a lot of waiting. And then you finally get to play your music. Wow. <laughs> and then you go back, go back to waiting. And then you go back to waiting. <laughs> Holy shit. Loading gear. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Also, um, you, just, you just passed, right? So, yeah, I think it was you. Yeah, so it's my turn, right? All right, the color is yellow. Well, look at that. Uno, oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> Uno, <laughs> Uno, and a plus two. Oh, my God. Holy shit. Um, yeah, so tell us, uh, do you have any fond memories from that first European tour? Yes, absolutely. Um, pass. Uh... It, the, the the problems with the tour didn't end there. I mean, I, I could go on for a long time about all the other things that went wrong, including like not getting our merch until halfway through the tour and having it having to spend thousands of dollars in taxes on it, and the van breaking down three times and us getting stranded in Norway and missing shows and the window of our van getting broken. And uh, uh, did you guys get like robbed or anything? No, luckily we didn't get robbed. So the window our, just our got driver broken. just backed up into a tree. Oh, okay. Okay. And smashed the window. Anyway, there was a lot of things that went wrong on that tour, but uh, I was so excited to, I, th- that was before I'd done a lot of touring anyway, period. And it was my first time in Europe and I was just so excited and thankful to be there and to be playing to anybody that gave a shit that, um, 
uh, I, I really enjoyed myself even with all the other stuff that's gone wrong. I've had tours that have gone so much smoother since then that I haven't enjoyed half as much just because it was the novelty and, and right, right, right. Just, especially the first year yeah, just tour. getting getting to just go oh, all these places I've never been before and and you know meet meet all sorts of different kinds of people and you know so now I really like. Um, appreciate that aspect of traveling and getting to talk to people who don't live in New York and don't live in America and have just this different perspective on the world. And, and it's interesting to see how the same just everybody is. Yeah. That, that, that's what I've realized more than, more than like celebrating the differences between people. It's just like, everybody's the fucking same. Really? Like people just want to like have enough money to live on and relax and like watch the TV shows they like and like drink beer. And that's just kind of like everybody everywhere in the world is yeah. like that that I've come across. And obviously I'm, I'm uh, often being thrown in the room with people that are like share the same interest in like weird music that I do. So we're going to we, we have that common ground kind of established already. So uh, but I think it's more than that going and being in all these different cities all over the world and just kind of observing the way people are walking around going about their business and going and eating lunch and going to bars and going to shows. That's where I feel just kind of like, you know what? Every big metropolitan area in the world is like, has a lot in common and it doesn't feel that different being in Tokyo than it feels being in New York, than it feels being in London, than it feels wow. being in Madrid. I mean, it's, then it feels being in Bogota, you know, was, right, right. I got to go to Colombia a couple years ago with, with Gorgats and it was just like, yeah, you know, here's, here I am my first time in South America. And this, doesn't feel that different from any, anywhere else I've been, you know? It, Especially in the cities, right? Sure. And, and that's the thing is when you're playing music, you just end up in the big cities. You're just in the most dense metropolitan areas <laughs> most, of, most of the time. So you, th that's, I feel like there's more in common with anybody anywhere in the world in that kind of an area than there is between two Americans, one living in upstate New York in a tiny town and one living in New York City. I think that those people have a much more different experience of the world than we have with somebody growing up in, in um, you know, in a giant city in Malaysia or something. You know what I mean? Like, it's, there's, obvious, there's obvious differences, but I think it's like that there's so much that's common for like a, a global culture, big city lifestyle. Right. Um, and a way of looking at things. Wow. It's a very interesting piece of analysis in terms of like world travel. Because like that's one of those things that, you know, we all want to do is, you know, travel the world. But, you know, finding out that like people are kind of the same is that, would you say that's kind of a disappointing feeling? Or? No, I, not at all. I, I, I think it's kind of comforting because I think people make such a big deal out of boundaries and borders and countries. And it's just so arbitrary. Like, it's we're all humans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's that we have so much more in common than we have differences with true. any other human in the world. Right. Uh, we all want the same things. We all just want to be safe and like have uh, have food on the table and, and and have the people that we care about be safe. And and we've confused that desire with this preservation, protection, separation of us from other people. Um, vibe, right. which is which is like everything that's wrong with the world. I think is is this separation of you and them, right? My people and your people. It's just we're all people. We're all people. And yeah, that's so. The good thing about doing this traveling is I feel like that's been nothing but been reinforced. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's being re been reinforced is the bullshit of borders and different countries. And because I have to deal with so much of that traveling on tour. And even worse, bands coming here to the States from other places. Mm. That's the thing that's really embarrassing to be an American, How's where that? I can go and play almost anywhere in the world for free. Mm. And I can get, I can go to any country in Europe with the exception of the UK and Russia without any kind of a visa or anything. And I can get paid any amount of money and it's fine. Everybody's okay with that. Because we realize it's a huge expense for me to get there. It stimulates the economy of the country that I go and play in because now people are coming to that venue and they're spending money in that country that they live in. But for some reason, Americans have it completely backwards where it's like, you should be so lucky to have the privilege to play in our country. 
it's going to cost you $2,000 per person per year just to spend your own money to come play here. Even if you get paid nothing, as a Canadian, you can't come here and play a show. Wow. Unless you spend eight months in advance getting the stupid visa, paying the two grand, and then it only lasts a year. And then every year you want to come back and play, it's another $2,000 that you pay to, to Donald Trump. Wow. I mean, okay, not specifically. But <laughs> to some degree to him, right? Yeah. So it, that's... That's the stuff that's reinforced. It's just the inanity of <laughs> countries and borders and us being different from you and, and, and how little sense it makes for it to be true of somebody from this place going to this place. And then if you're from that place coming here, nope, it's a whole different story. Yeah. Um, so it, it just makes me absolutely furious with uh, this, the, the political state of the world. Wow. And then you go and you just hang out with the people and you're just like, oh, we're, like, we're all the same. We're all like, same. We just all like Morbid Angel. Right. Yeah. Hell yeah. And Metallica. Hell yeah. You know, it's just, I don't know. We just want to, everyone just wants to have that thing. Yeah, you know, it's just be, pe people, people want the same basic things everywhere. And it's just gotten really confused with the, uh, the fractalization, the compartmentalization of, of every aspect of, of, of modern culture. Right. Um, and you know, you see it everywhere from like people being too caught up in what subgenre of death metal you're, in. you know, it's the same, it's the same thing as why Eliane was talking before about, it's the same basic human sentiment. I think it's like why Quebec wants independence. Right. It's just like compartmentalization, exaggerating the differences between people. No, we're about this. You're about that. You don't get me. It's not going to do us any good. No, so, not at all. If, 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 we, if, we can, if we could just take that same impulse and just flip the, the way in which we institute it, mm. then you have the opposite. You have everybody coming together and realizing that we all kind of want the same things and, you know, that we could all maybe kind of compromise on a way to make that a, make that a reality. Right, right. Colin Marston is for the people. <laughs> for the people. Vote Colin so, Marston 2020. In this genre, I mean... <laughs> Yeah. Well, in 2020. Not running. <laughs> so in this genre, um, I mean, you meet a lot of people that have the same interests, like the same thing, do the same things, play the same music. Uh, is there any music you listen to that isn't metal driven, classical? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, like a lot of the music that I didn't enjoy as much growing up that I've been getting more into, I'd say in the last, you know, five or 10 years is, um, the, like, um, 60s and 70s free jazz. Uh, like, I, I never really had much of an appreciation for jazz growing up, like like a little bit. I played some I played some sort of standards and traditional stuff with an old bandmate of mine that I, I really had fun doing. And I liked that music, but it never grabbed me in the same way as like the, uh, um, the, the 20th century classical and the metal and the King Crimson and that stuff. So um, I think, yeah, when Weasel joined Behold the Octopus back in, what was it, like 2009? He was in the band like 2009 to 2013. He's a, he makes a lot of improvised music and is like a total encyclopedia of knowledge about free jazz and um, has a large collection of stuff. So from, from the years of, since then of him joining the band and then I still play with him in other projects, um, just having him in my life. And a lot of the other um, improvisers that I record here at the studio, I found out about a lot of uh, really, really cool music that I just didn't, didn't really, have the interest to find before. Um, so, you know, like uh, somebody like Evan Parker, a saxophonist, um, incredible. Uh, the John Coltrane records that were more of his free jazz records, like Ohm and Interstellar Space, some of my favorites now. Peter Brotsman, the, the German saxophonist, um, that record Machine Gun, and some of his other records with uh, um, Han Benink, um and uh, Tony Oxley, a free jazz drummer that really influenced a lot of the new Behold the Octopus drum writing. So yeah, there's this whole world. This a, a couple of Alice Coltrane records I've been really enjoying. Um, that's that's music that I'm excited about more now because it's like a little bit newer for for me. Just in the last five or ten years, um, been appreciating this kind of just yeah. Because I, I was so hung up, I think, on like composition before, and it it took a second for me to kind of like 
appreciate this like looser improvised music and, and, and I guess understanding that you're not necessarily trying to, it's not the same end goal as when you're composing stuff and controlling every detail. Right, right. Um, so not having the same expectation for what it's supposed, what the, what the music is supposed to be like when it's all said and done, I think kind of like opened up something new in, in, in me and my appreciation of music. Yeah, I recently listened to uh, Alice Coltrane's Journey to, I forgot what the, the rest of the title was called, but it really opened me up to cool. the freeform jazz and how she puts everything together. It's, it's yeah, and her, her style of freeform jazz is pretty pretty unique. And like this one record I've been listening to has lots of um, like string orchestra arrangements, um, universal consciousness. Right, right. Uh, so yeah, it's like, sure, I guess you could call it free jazz, but it's it's there's also this classical sounding aspect oh, because it's the string section. It's not just a bunch of people doing free improv. It's it, There are arrangements. And so it's, yeah, it, a, a really interesting nexus of, of, of uh, composition, improvisation. Yeah. <laughs> in terms of like playing ability, people talk about competency. That guy's incompetent at drums or whatever. Um, that's another thing I don't really believe in because... <laughs> Often I find musicians who a lot of people would view as being like less competent or like not as proficient at the, their instrument. Often I find those people playing like far more interesting. And I would rather listen to somebody who's like less smooth maybe than somebody who's like really got their shit down and sounds really slick, but doesn't have like any kind of like grit or, or like push or emotion behind their playing. So in a way, I'm actually more, slightly more predisposed to like a musician that maybe people would view as being incompetent. And maybe that goes for writing too, because there's there's um there's that there's that Australian rapper Raid. Raid. Do you know this guy? Yeah, yeah, I know. Raid. He's got the weirdest flow, and I think maybe a lot of people would be like, "Oh, this guy doesn't know what he's doing," or like he 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 doesn't understand rhythm or any of those things. And, I don't care if that's true or not. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But the point is, his flow is bizarre. The way his rhythms lock up with the drums is very strange. And I love it. Wow. Like, it's, it, I don't care if he knows what he's doing or he doesn't. It's really interesting. And it, and it makes me smile every time. Straight up. So it's like, you know, in a way, I don't care whether it's good or bad or competent or incompetent. I'm enjoying it. Yeah, absolutely. Yo, on the topic of like rap and hip hop, I remember I was talking to Eliane and she told us that like you guys went to a Little Ugly Main show. So I didn't go. Oh, you didn't go? Yeah, oh, no, yeah. I've never, she's seen him twice. Twice, um, okay. But, uh, but yeah, uh, um, definitely like, yeah, she, uh, he's like one of Eliane's favorite uh, producers. Oh, word, word. All right, cool. So like, yeah, what else, outside of like instrumental music, do you listen to like a lot of hip hop or like rap at all? I don't listen to a lot of it, like in terms of like stuff that I put on, right. but I'm exposed to, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, like I, I'm definitely like appreciative of um, hip hip hop was another uh, form of music, kind of like free jazz, where yeah, I just sort of didn't get exposed to a lot, didn't know about a lot. There was there was some stuff growing up. My my buddy George liked. He was into, you know, just like a lot of the stuff that you would expect like a teenage white guy to be into like <laughs> Wu-Tang, Dr. Uh, Octagon, you know, Dr. Octagon, that's tank. <laughs> but, but you know, that like that's, that stuff was good and I, and I did appreciate it, but it was like, I, you know, it wasn't the underground stuff. Um, right. It, uh, and I think, uh, yeah, Elian got me into some, some more underground stuff when we started meeting like this, this Ohio doom rap stuff, which uh, I haven't really like checked back in into in a while, but yeah, like uh, the buttress and Jack Tripper and these kind of really strange, oh, like, Jack Jack like Jack 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 satanic, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, Jack Tripper. yeah, and then all this kind of like funny, new, weird, like mumbly trap music, you know, become aware of and kind of like appreciated some of that, really. Um, and uh, wow. what else? I don't know, yeah, so so. Not not stuff that I've kind of gone out of my way on my own and like researched a lot, but like I, I've I've heard some some more like recent modern stuff, which I was like, oh, that, that that's cool, that's interesting. Word, wow, you heard it here. Colin Marston enjoys you know mumble rap. <laughs> 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 that's crazy. I never thought I'd hear anything like that. But um, yeah, like going into like Colin Marston. My my, fa my favorite 
guy probably in recent years is uh, this um, Dominican like reggaeton guy Principe Baru I remember oh, you yeah. told me I heard him in the grocery store and then for a year was like trying to figure out what it was and then eventually was hanging out with somebody who was like I think it might be this guy like described the song to him and right. like, it might be this guy and we looked him up and it was totally it wow. and uh, yeah just that's some that's some weird um, shit where you're you're not really sure like what where he's coming from or what the vibe is. I was just intrigued. Straight up. Just sounds good. Yeah, I mean, just didn't sound like anything I heard before. It was just very, like, um, like non-musical, for lack of a better term. Like, not traditionally musical, just very, like, sparse and, and, and uh, like, uncomfortable sounding. Right, right. Which, you know, oh. hey, sparse and uncomfortable. Sign me up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, I remember you put you put me and Matt onto uh, Prince of Baru when we were uh, doing the mixing for Winter Triangle. Oh, nice, nice. And, yeah, and I remember Matt, he decided to take out his phone. He went on Spotify and he put on fucking Pitbull <laughs> afterwards. It was the cringiest thing I've seen in a long time. Awesome. But like, yeah, he loves to do shit like that. So you said you heard Prince of Baru in a grocery store. Mm -hmm. So tell me, what do you usually get during your groceries? Uh, I eat a lot of kale, a lot of Fuji apples, mm -hmm. um, celery, avocados. Those are, those are the staples. Oh, cashew nuts, raisins, or cashew nuts or peanut, peanut butter. Peanut butter. Or those are kind of my main foods. Or what do you usually have for breakfast? Um, I am not a breakfast guy. Oh, I like to drink mate, mate, caffeine and water. And then usually like sort of like eat lightly during the day. And uh -huh. then uh, I'm not saying that this is healthy, but I like to eat usually like when I'm done for the day, I'll have like a big meal. Um, and then during the day, just kind of eat, eat small. But today, Elian made that awesome vegetable Medley. soybean. Thing, so I had, I had a proper breakfast today. Oh yeah. Wow. That's sick. Um, so I remember I asked you this question before, but you know, we were talking about being vegan versus being vegetarian. You're a vegetarian, correct? Mm -hmm. So, you know, talk to us about that lifestyle choice. Um, yeah, just never felt comfortable eating meat my whole life. But, uh, um, you know, grew, grew up eating it and, and, and enjoying it, but always kind of didn't feel too comfortable with it. And then when I, when I just moved out of my parents' house and I came up for school and stuff and started, you know, not having food put in front of me every night uh, that was just how i where i gravitated towards and then pretty much went straight to vegan and was was uh totally animal product free for uh five or six years and then um decided i didn't need to be so uh letter of the law about it and um uh still had the sort of the same diet tendencies that i used to have but um yeah i, I opened up my my palate a little bit word word and yeah, still still feel pretty strongly about not really wanting to eat meat and also not really, uh, I don't feel like I need it biologically. I, certain people like, like Eliane would, would want to be in terms of their uh, philosophy, but you know, everybody's body is different. And some, pe some people's bodies seem to just need animal protein. And through her experiments with different diets, she's found that, that she feels the healthiest when she has it occasionally. Right, right. I've had other friends that are the same. Yeah, it's like, you know, I don't really want to be a meat eater, but I feel like if I don't have some kind of animal protein at least once a week or something, I, I don't feel healthy. Right. For me, I, I feel fine. For my physiology, it seems to work really well. Right. So it, I'm just lucky that that goes hand in hand with the other things that I care about in terms of, like, economy and environment and, and animal rights and all right. those things. Word. That's awesome. Um, so when you're not playing or recording or eating, what's a typical day for a common person? Uh, well, but that is a typical day. That's, oh, that's okay. the only things I do. <laughs> 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 so when I'm not doing those things, I'm asleep. Word. Fair enough. <laughs> How many hours of sleep do you get? I, I sleep well. Yeah, I sleep, I, well? I sleep like seven to nine hours. Oh, that's healthy. Yeah. So that is healthy, yeah. That's no. I mean, not every night, because there's going to be some nights I go to bed late and got to get up early. But yeah, I uh, definitely am not a not an early riser, not a uh, not a light sleeper. Straight up, Word. love my sleep. Yeah, absolutely. Who doesn't? You know, uh, you got anything else to add? Word. So, Colin Marston, a man of the people, a man for animals, and 
a worldwide, you know, magician of music. So <laughs> thank you very much, Colin. Thank yeah. you so much, Colin. Yeah, great for it. Thanks for having me. Nobody won yet. I did win. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't even notice. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Fuck yeah. That's one. Lunar Art. space. Lunar thank space. Thank you, Colin. There we go. Whew. Is it lunar space? Lunar space. Cool.